Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Hajj Step by Step. I'm your host, Musa McGuire. We appreciate you joining us for this comprehensive program on the rights of Hajj. And our guide for this Hajj is Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, at this stage, we've almost reached the end of Hajj. We're now at the 12th or 13th of Dhul Hijjah. But we want to cover some of the details of these final days just to make sure we hit on all the important points. Uh, you talked in the previous episode about the pilgrims staying at Mina during these days, the Ayama Tashriq. What happens if someone does not stay at Mina during these days? Or what if they uh, give, the, give someone else the authority to throw the stones for them, but they decide, well, okay, now I'm going to go stay in the hotel and have a good time? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه Praise be to Allah, we praise him and we seek his help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can show him guidance. We bear witness that there is no God who is worthy of worship but Allah, and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger. Uh, concerning staying at Mina and spending the night at Mina particularly is a mandatory act amongst the rites of Hajj, which the pilgrim must do by himself, and it cannot simply be done by hiring or assigning somebody else to do it on their behalf. We said concerning stoning the Jamarat, a person who is weak, ill, or a pregnant woman, or a person who cannot go to throw the Jamarat, may ask somebody else to throw it on their behalf and it's got to be done this way that the person have to throw on behalf of himself or herself first then on behalf of those who requested from them to throw the jamarat on their behalf and, uh, and that has to be by their permission so it cannot just happen by uh, you know voluntarily making it on behalf of somebody without uh, having them uh, giving them this authority those who uh, do not stay the nights of Mina, or most of the night at Mina, they have violated one of the wajibat and the sha'air of Hajj, and they have to pay a ransom, which is slaughtering a sheep or giving a dam, as people normally uh, call it, uh, blood, uh, to make up this violation, and to ask Allah's forgiveness for not staying without a valid reason. But those who uh, just assign somebody else to throw the stones on their behalf and simply they catch up with their plane flight or they stay at their hotel they have uh, messed up a big time because uh, assigning somebody to throw the stones on your behalf is permissible but you've got to be there in Mina you cannot just simply throw uh, all the stones in one day and leave uh, and you cannot have somebody to throw on your behalf while you're sitting somewhere else or you have left already uh, Mecca, went to home or uh, went to uh, uh, visit the prophetic masjid. Uh, other people make another violation which I would like to alert the pilgrims to, which is that they go to the next step, which is they perform tawaful wada, right after they perform tawaful ifada and so forth, and they go stay the three days and nights in Mina. And afterward, they're ready to leave, uh, and they think by that they have done tawaful wada. Trying to expedite the process will take you nowhere. Uh, exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did, we have to follow. We were commanded to follow the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ and every bit he did during his Hajj وسلم, and not to change. Shaykh, we talked several times about the sacrifice both on the day of Eid but also the sacrifice to make up for a mistake or uh, some violation during the Hajj. What if a person cannot afford either, either one of these sacrifices, the one uh, on the day of Eid or one that for some reason is required? Well, uh, it's very important to explain the difference between the two. 
the sacrifice which is known as al hajj uh, is mandatory upon one who is performing Umrah and Hajj in the same season of Hajj during the months of Hajj whether it is Hajj al tamattu or Hajj al qiran and that's to be done on uh, the Eid day the 10th day of uh, Dhul Hijjah uh, the description of this Hadi is similar to the description of Al Uthiyah and similarly the distribution of this sacrifice a person may eat from that actually he is recommended to eat and to drink from the soup of this sacrifice give gifts to friends and others and distribute one third of it or more uh, to the poor and to the needy uh, as far as the fidya or the ransom this is a penalty for a violation that the pilgrim has committed or a wajib that he missed in this case the ransom or the slaughter the offering or the sacrifice he's given would be slaughtered there at the time of the violation, at the place of the violation, and uh, it will be distributed among the poor, and he would not taste it or take anything out of it for himself. Sheikh, we get to this issue now of tawaf al wada, which is really the, 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 the farewell tawaf. Um, is this the final step of Hajj, and, and what exactly are the requirements of this act? Uh, before we talk about tawaf al wada, um, you asked me whether uh, if a person cannot afford the hajj, if there is an alternative or not. Yes. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated in the Quran that if one cannot afford the sacrifice, al hajj, uh, saying, Azza Jalla, Fasiyamu thalathati ayyamin fil hajj wa sabaatin idha rajatum. Tilka asharatun kamila. Indicating that al hajj is mandatory on one who is making Umrah and Hajj and he's not a Meccan. He's not from the Meccan dwellers. And if in case that he's not financially capable to afford this sacrifice or al hajj, then he may do otherwise fast three days during the Hajj which may begin by the first day of Ayyam al tashiq but not the Eid day under any circumstances. And afterward, whenever he goes home, he can complete the ten by fasting seven days, and they don't have to be consecutive at home, after he goes home. Uh, now concerning Tawaf al wadah which is the last activity before departing Mecca to anywhere. Whether to go on home, or if you're going to Medina and you're not planning to come back, Tawaf al wada the word wada in Arabic is a, a, a farewell. That's why we should understand it this way, that we're giving a farewell to the ancient house, to al kaaba So it should be the last activity a person would do. And that's why I said it's not valid to do it, then go and stay in Mina uh, for Ayyam al-Tashriq. No. Once I'm done, I'm ready to leave. I wrapped up and I packed my luggages, and I'm waiting for my transportation. Uh, a few hours before, I would allow some time to perform tawaf al wada. Tawaf al wada is mandatory, is wajib. And for one who does not do it, will be made up by a penalty of offering the ransom of slaughtering uh, either a sheep or anything that would make up for it. Uh, tawaf al wada will be done similar to any other tawaf, whether tawaf al qudum, tawaf al ifada. Tawafu al tatawa except that it is a wajib, it's not one of the pillars of Al Hajj. Who will be exempted from Tawafu al Wada? Women during their menses, they will not have to do Tawafu al Wada. As for Sophia, may Allah be pleased with her, she experienced her menses after she did Tawafu al Ifada. The Prophet وسلم, said, Awa Habi Satuna, he is she going to withhold us here because. Uh, if she did not do tawaf al ifada, they would have to remain until she would do tawaf al ifada because it's a rakn, it's one of the pillars of Hajj. So the Prophet ﷺ was informed, Ya Rasulullah, she already did tawaf al ifada. So he said, Then let's go. That was an indication that a woman during her menses, if she did tawaf al ifada, she does not have to do tawaf al wida' and she may leave without paying any penalty or ransom or even worrying about it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her an ease in this condition. 
Sheikh, are there are there certain common mistakes for uh, tawaf al wada? We talked about some of the problems with the other kinds of tawaf, but are there some particular to this tawaf? Yes, we normally see some people uh, upon performing tawaf al wada, they leave backwards. They're facing the Kaaba and they step backwards, thinking this is a, a way to uh, honor the Kaaba and to uh, keep a covenant with the Kaaba that you may come back once again. This is a practice which the Prophet ﷺ did not do, nor any of his companions. And accordingly, this is an act of innovation. And while you are in Hajj or outside Hajj, you should follow exactly the traditions of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and not to innovate, even if you read that somewhere in any book. Uh, uh, others would uh, make sure that they would wipe their hands and their bodies against some parts of the Kaaba other than the black stone, uh, leaving some memories and they would take their ihram off or their scarves for some women and they would wrap them against, uh, rub them against the Kaaba uh, for good memories so that they would be uh, uh, wrapped as a shroud uh, for them upon their death and so on. These, all these acts are uh, uh, wrong acts and the Hajj should avoid all of them. Is, uh, you mentioned uh, ihram. Is ihram, the garments of ihram, still worn at this stage by some, or is it, is it permissible or impermissible? Whenever we see people performing tawaf al ifada and we see them performing tawaf al wada, they are normally in the case of their uh, regular uh, clothes because they're not in a state of ihram. What I'm referring to is some people are keen to do those practices by uh, rubbing their scarves for women or rubbing their ihram for men. This is wrong. But in Tawaf al Ifada, of course, uh, people would uh, have taken off their ihram and they have taken a ghusl and uh, adorned themselves for this ruqn, which is a Tawaf al Ifada. Tawaf al Wuda'a, likewise, that a person is already in a state of tahallul and is not wearing al ihram clothes. Well, for many of the pilgrims, the journey will continue after Mecca. Uh, but before we get to that after a break, um, do you have any words of advice just for the feeling at this time when you are leaving Mecca, when you've completed Hajj, any, any final thoughts? Uh, a lot. Just remember that uh, you are totally a different person. You're now a newborn. You've come to this place with great hopes and expectations. You've come with loads of sins and bad deeds, and now all of that is gone. Uh, remember the tears that you shed there in, uh, uh, in, in Mecca and while performing Hajj. Uh, remember when you cried for your sins, when you begged Allah for mercy and forgiveness, and you renewed your covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a better person. So try to maintain that after you leave Mecca and you go home and be a messenger of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, for many, as I said, after Mecca, there, was all, there will also be a visit to the city of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. And after a short break, we're going to get to that and uh, hear some advice about how to approach that journey as well. So please stay with us for that. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Hajj Step by Step. After leaving Mecca, many pilgrims will decide to take a visit, uh, make a visit to the Prophet's city, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Medina, uh, and also to visit his masjid. Now the first question I want to ask you is, is this visit a part of Hajj or is it a mandatory component of Hajj? 
No, actually, the visit to the Prophetic Masjid in the city of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and Medina al Munawwara is not a part of Hajj and has nothing to do with Hajj or Umrah at all. However, it is permissible during any time of the year and it is recommended as well. Since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated in one hadith that it's not permissible for any person to assume a journey, especially to visit any masjid to pray in, except one of the three masjid. Al-Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, and the Masjid of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Al-Madina, and the farthest mosque, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, and please join me to pray and ask Allah the Almighty to free Al-Masjid al-Aqsa to make us uh, able to offer salah in Al-Masjid al-Aqsa while we're alive. Sheikh, you mentioned that before visiting Mecca, it's an etiquette that one should uh, take a ghusl and uh, make some preparations. Is there any preparations or etiquettes for entering either the city of Medina or the Prophet's mosque, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran stated that, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu khudu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Not only the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but take your adornment, beautify yourself before visiting or entering any masjid. Now we are visiting uh, the, the second most sacred place on earth, which is Al-Masjid al-Nabawi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that one salah in his masjid is better than a, a thousand salah, a, a thousand prayer in any other masjid, of course, except Al-Masjid al-Haram. Since one prayer, one salah in Al-Masjid al-Haram is better than 100,000 prayer in any other masjid. So imagine the, the amount of reward you're collecting by offering a single salah at the prophetic masjid or uh, al-masjid al-haram. And that's why I see this opportunity. And I remind my dear uh, pilgrims or those who are going for Umrah not to waste this opportunity. If you're not eating, nor drinking, nor asleep, then you're either reciting Quran in the masjid al-haram, masjid al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa uh, or praying in uh, any of them and or making tawaf. Other than that, do not waste this opportunity at all. <clears throat> now, Shaykh, we know that the Prophet وسلم, is buried uh, at the site of this masjid, in the masjid. Um, what is the etiquette for, for visiting the grave? Or, or perhaps I should ask first, is our purpose to visit the grave or the masjid or both? Uh, the intention is actually to visit the prophetic masjid, to collect the word which we just stated by praying there in the prophetic masjid. As far as you remark concerning that the, the, the Prophet ﷺ's uh, grave is in the masjid, uh, actually the Prophet ﷺ was not buried in the masjid, mm. nor did he order his companions to do so. As a matter of fact, he emphasized on the uh, restriction of being buried in the masjid, whether it is a prophet or a righteous man. But during, uh, he was buried in his room, sallallahu alayhi wa which was just adjacent to the masjid. And during the expansions which took place during the Umayyads, they included the rooms of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa within the masjid. So anyway, uh, there are of course certain etiquette that a person would follow upon visiting the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is the entrance as we see in the video. Of course, when you enter the masjid, in general, or any masjid, not only the prophetic masjid, you step in with the right foot. And you say, uh, العظيم, الكريب, القديم, الرجيم, I seek refuge with Allah, the greatest, and in His noble face, and in His eternal power, from the outcast Satan. Oh Allah, forgive me my sins and open for me the doors of your mercy. Then you proceed in uh, offering the salutation of the masjid or tahiyatul masjid and pray two rak'ahs tahiyatul masjid. It will be best if you get to offer these two rak'ahs in ar rawda as we've just seen in the video, that uh, uh, ar rawda is an area between the uh, the home or the room of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which he's buried in right now and his member the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated in one hadith ma bayna bayti wa min bari rawdatun min riyad al-jannah 
the area which is between my house and my member, the pulpit of the Prophet mm -hmm. is just a garden of the gardens of paradise. So imagine that this area is very, very great. Uh, if you can offer two rak'ahs there, do so, or even if you can do more, and then give time for somebody else to offer two rak'ahs as well, then proceed on to pay the visit to uh, the grave of the Prophet وسلم, and there will be also an etiquette of standing before him and saluting him saying Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiy wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh with tranquility and calmness and complete khushu'ah you are standing before the grave of the greatest man ever sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we were commanded in the Quran to send the peace and salutation upon him. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Send much of peace and salutation upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You may do that while standing before his qabr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also you may say, Allahumma ati Muhammadan al-wasila wal-fadila wa ba'athuma maqam al-mahmood al-ladhi wa'adda which means, O Allah, grant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-wasila which is the nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a special place very near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment al-fadila, the favor Wal-maqam al-mahmood is a praiseworthy position which Allah promised His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam with in heaven. Uh, Shaykh, the, we, we also know that the two of the, the, the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are buried next to him, exactly. Abu Bakr and Omar. Exactly. Um, is there also an etiquette for visiting their graves, or should we pass them sure. by? Sure. They were actually buried in the same room where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was buried. So you step uh, ahead to your right where there will be the grave of the great companion Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda and uh, another step forward to the right there will be the grave of Umar ibn Khattab may Allah be pleased with both of them and all the companions before each one you will step, uh, stop in front of uh, his grave and greet them and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his uh, mercy, forgiveness and pleasure upon them uh, you notice that we did not say anything about rubbing hands, touching, or raising hands and making dua. These are all acts which are totally wrong and can actually violate your entire journey. Uh, whenever you are there before the Qabr of the Prophet ﷺ, you only greet him and send a peace and salutation upon him. Uh, similarly with his companions, you greet them and pray and ask Allah to send his blessings upon them. But if you'd like to make supplications and dua, then you need to turn towards the Qibla and make your dua. You never ask of anything from the Prophet ﷺ or any humankind. You only ask of Allah, the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh, you mentioned some of the, the, the uh, incorrect practices or misconceptions about the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes you hear stories of people who claim that they went to the grave and they had a conversation with the Prophet or he reached out and shook their hand and, and, and used this to uh, maybe assert their own authority. Is there any basis for these kind of tales? Uh, nothing of that is true at all. Uh, you know, we can discuss this in details in another occasion, but right now the right practice is to stand, as we said, and greet him quietly uh, in, in a peaceful manner. Then you step forward, you greet Abu Bakr, then Omar, then you step out or you turn towards the Qibla and you make your dua only to Allah. Since these are the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, If you ever ask, only ask of Allah. And if you seek help, only seek the help of Allah not of any human, including Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaykh, we also know that many of the other great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are buried in Medina, uh, in a graveyard there. Is there an etiquette for, for visiting this graveyard? I mean, do we, do we still know where it is and how does a pilgrim Sure, the this? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go and visit them in a graveyard or a cemetery which is known as Al-Baqiyah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, this is very near to uh, the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Once you step out from the visit of the Qabr of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you could see it to your right hand. Uh, at that corner, you go if it is open or not. There, Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, and too many other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu the mothers of the believers, are all buried there. There, you stand, or if you get to enter, and you greet them with the same greeting the Prophet Sallallahu taught us, the greeting of the cemetery. Uh, Assalamu alaykum ahla diyari min al mu'minin wa al muslimin. Wa inna insha'Allahu bikum lahiqoon. Nas'alu allaha lana wa lakum al afiyah. That's it. Which is, peace be with you the dwellers of this place among the believers and the Muslims. Insha'Allah, definitely we will join you. We ask Allah to pardon you and us and to protect you and us from the fire of hell and the horror of the day of judgment. Then this is the ziyarah and the only thing that a person may do. All other false practices such as making supplications there, crying and calling upon the dead, these are all acts of shirk without any doubt. Shaykh, what about other landmarks that exist in Medina or, or things that you know, will evoke our memory of the time of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions? Um, what does exist to this day in Medina? Is it recommended to visit it? And are there any, any etiquettes? As far as landmarks, there is plenty. But what's recommended to visit is Masjid Quba. This is the Masjid which Allah mentioned in the Quran that لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلْ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَقُومَ فِيهِ A Masjid which is established on righteousness from the first day is more worthy to uh, stand in it in prayer. The Prophet ﷺ used to perform wudu, and particularly on Saturday, and go and offer two rak'ahs there. He said, ﷺ, whoever performs perfect wudu and offers two rak'ahs in Masjid Quba, it would be considered, as far as the word, as offering a umrah. There is a great reward for visiting Masjid Quba and praying two rak'ahs there. And the Prophet ﷺ used to do that awfully, uh, as I said, that at least once a week. Uh, there is also the side scene of the Battle of Uhud, which took place uh, in this area. Uh, it's important also to notice that there, there will be the graveyard of almost 70 of the murders, of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu amongst them Hamza, the Prophet's uncle, uh, Asadullah, and Sayyid al-Shuhada, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. So you stand there once again and you do like what we did in the first time by visiting the cemetery of Al-Baqiyah. You greet the dwellers there and ask Allah Al-Afiyah for yourself and for them. And that's it. People collecting uh, uh, stones and collecting memories from there and writing their names or begging help from the companions who are already dead in this graveyard. These are all false, false practices. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what will benefit us and to help us to understand our deen properly. Unfortunately, many people uh, spend a lot of money and make a lot of effort and come from a long way. And by the end, they come and they do some shirk practices which would join their entire journey. May Allah guide all of us. Sheikh, I really want to thank you uh, for myself and I'm sure for our viewers for taking us through this journey uh, through Hajj. Uh, and also to the visit to Medina. Um, though we're not finished, inshallah, we'll still deal with some more issues. So please stay tuned for our next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Thank you.